And I did debrief our uh, junior age uh, uh, young people this morning that we'll have our uh, junior church in here with us. And uh, they have been instructed, though, afterwards, the Alexanders would like to meet with them uh, to go over their work. But if you've got somebody, if you've got a younger one that, uh, that uh, you are comfortable putting in uh, with the nursery there, uh, we do have an, a, a variety of ages, and they're, they'll be well, well cared for um, in the class there. And so you may do that at this time. It's going to be in 1 Samuel chapter... One first Samuel chapter one and we're going to examine the life of a father the best that we can with the with the little bit of information that we're given on this man named Elkanah and we're going to see here this morning some characteristics of a godly father some characteristics of a godly father how many are familiar with Elkanah you you're at least familiar you heard the name in the past. Uh, some and and I don't. If you don't, I don't blame you, uh, because uh, Elkanah was the father of Samuel, uh, but Samuel was uh, given back to the Lord. Maybe you can kind of consider it somewhat of an ad- adoption, a little bit, I guess. But Samuel was given back to the Lord by Hannah, his mother and father, I believe, uh, just when he was after he'd been weaned, and uh, that was the way of dedicating the. Hannah prayed for a child, um, and uh, God answered the prayer. They, she finally had one between her and Elkanah, her husband. And she said, God, if you'll give me a child, I'll give him back to you all the days of his life. And uh, that's what she did. She, was, uh, she fulfilled the commitment as God answered the prayer. How very hard that must have been for somebody, for a, for a mother to pray for a child. And uh, God, if you give me the child, I'll give him back to you. Well. She lived up to her promise, and she gave him back to the Lord. Uh, and what that means was she let uh, Eli, the priest, he Samuel ministered to the Lord uh, under the supervision of Eli, the priest, and then Samuel grew up to be a very powerful prophet, preacher of God's word, and uh, God used him in a great and mighty way. But how hard that must have been for a mother. God, okay, you answered the prayer here. I thank you so much for that, but... You know, what's the use in praying for him if I just got to give him back pretty much, you know? That's what would be going through my mind, but uh, it was for the Lord that she gave him back. And so that's kind of uh, where, that's where this story picks up from right here. We're not going to consider all of the life of Samuel, but we're going to examine this man, Elkanah, here for just a brief time uh, this morning. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1, The Bible says, now there was a certain man. Notice the Bible calls him a certain man. A certain man, and men are fathers. There was a certain man of Ramah, Tham, Zophim. And don't crucify me if I didn't get the pronunciation right. Um, Probably you're not so certain yourself. (laughs) Ramah, Tham, Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of uh, Jerohim, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. Now let me point out there before we continue, that's not a good situation right there, okay? That's not a good thing. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that God condones it or that he's in favor of it, all right? And so uh, it starts off by telling us of the trouble that could be in this household. Uh, The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons, Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Let's bow this morning and let's ask the Lord to help us. God, I need you. 
Lord, I thank you for the examples in scriptures of fathers. Lord, I thank you for the ultimate example of, in scripture of you as our heavenly father. Lord, I pray that you'd minister to our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray that you just would work among us. Uh, Lord, I think of these young people. I think of even older folks, perhaps, that maybe they did not have the father figure, Lord, that uh, you, the stereotypical household portrays and that most that everybody would like to have, Lord. But may we know and may we be reminded that when we get saved, we get born into your family and you become our heavenly father. You're the greatest daddy that there is. I pray that we'd be encouraged by that. I pray that we'd be strengthened. And just like we can have a, a, uh, a relationship with an earthly father, even more so we can have a relationship with you as heavenly father. You desire to talk to us through your word. You desire for us to talk to you through prayer. You desire to fellowship with us and, and provide our every need. Lord, you supply our every need. You shed your blood. The Bible says, greater love hath no man than this. You, you gave your life for us. The ultimate sacrifice in shedding your blood so that we can have the promise of eternal life in heaven upon receiving you. God, I pray you'd minister your word to our hearts this morning. Challenge us as fathers, Lord, perhaps. Encourage us, strengthen us. And uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we can set some goals, Lord, this younger generation here this morning. And uh, Lord, meet with us. We need you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you found the perfect Father's Day gift yet? Uh, fathers, have you found the perfect Father's Day gift? Um, people that are going to get gifts for the fathers, if you haven't already, the Praise the Lord, church got you covered, right? These are some pretty cool gifts here uh, this morning. And But uh, if not, I want to make a recommendation. In fact, it's the same gift that I'd recommend for mothers as well on Mother's Day. In the Bible, God gave us the Ten Commandments. And uh, within those Ten Commandments, there's good instruction. And it, uh, the Word of God instructs us instructs us, by the way, there's many more commandments than just 10 uh, commandments in God's word, but uh, there are some, there's the basis for which we can worship the Lord uh, through these 10 commandments. And uh, God gave us the 10 commandments in, in instructing us how we should live and how we should act towards him and one another, and it nestled between the commands to remember the Sabbath Number four, and thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill. Uh, number six, God gave us the fifth commandment. And that fifth commandment is this, honor your father and mother. And all of us, that's applicable to us here, we're to honor our parents, honor thy father and, and honor thy mother. That word honor means this, it means to regard with great respect, to esteem or give recognition. And let me say this, by the way, it can be done whether your father is still alive or not. And it's not contingent upon whether you had the, the dream dad in your life or you had no dad in your life that helped you in different circumstances uh, uh, through your life. But uh, the fact of the matter is, it's a command of God that God gives us to honor our mother and our fathers. And um, God... The fact that God even added honor your father to the Ten Commandments show us how important it is uh, to him and how important it ought to be to us as well to honor our parents. And so there are a lot of things that we can give our dads on Father's Day, but let us not forget the most important thing. The best gift that we can give our dads on Father's Day is to honor him. That's what we want to do here a little bit this morning. But let's face it, Father's Day isn't quite as big a deal as Mother's Day, is it? Uh, we've got a good attendance here this morning. I'm thankful for everybody that showed up. But on Mother's Day, there's usually a higher attendance on uh, for, for church service. And uh, mothers often receive flowers. Emotions are running higher. And there are uh, gifts that are given, oftentimes maybe meal at the home, People gather at mom's house and all to pay honor to the hands that rock the cradle. But on Father's Day, the church isn't as full typically. Emotions are not as high and 
businesses don't profit nearly as much as they do during Mother's Day. Now, back before cell phones became commonplace, I read that Southwestern Bell reported that Mother's Day is the busiest telephone day of the year, but Father's Day was the bigger moneymaker for them because there were more collect calls on Father's Day. <laughs> on Father's Day than any other day of the year. But, you know, it's not easy being a dad. It seems like dads spend the first couple of years of their children's life encouraging them to walk and talk and, and say, Dad, I'm pretty sure we had one that said Dad first, didn't we? Rocky? Was it Rocky when he was just one? I mean, he's super intelligent. He said, uh, I was walking from the, from the hallway to the bedroom, and he popped up and said, Hi, Dad. I think, if I remember that right. But, but um, it's not easy being a dad. We teach them uh, to walk and to talk. And then for the next several years, uh, we teach them to sit down and be quiet. In the Webster's Dictionary, uh, father comes right before the word fatigued. But it also comes right after the word fathead. I don't know if that means anything, but uh, those are just some facts there for you. You know, unfortunately, in today's society, we live in a culture that really marginalizes or has marginalized the role of fathers in the family. If you watch TV uh, for any amount of time, you know there's a lot of shows nowadays that really dumb down the character of the dad. And especially Disney shows, I want to say, the, the father character is always portrayed as a fathead dummy and, and uh, not much respect is shown for the father. And shows like The Simpsons have turned their fathers um, uh, and fatherhood in general into laughing stocks and you know, we've come a long way from Leave it to Beaver and shows like the Andy Griffith Show. The fact of the matter is God puts a, a high, uh, uh, fathers on a, on a high pedestal. And whether we live it out um, is, is irrelevant, really. We are, to, we are to behave like fathers, and God still wants us to acknowledge and honor uh, the fathers in our lives. These portrayals that we see in society couldn't be further from the truth. They may not see it, especially when they're young, but a father is more influential in the development of a child's life than any other factor. And that's applicable whether there's a father involved every day in the child's life or not. The more, whether the, whether the father's involved in their life or not, and uh, the older the kids get, the, the more they'll learn to appreciate a godly father. Mark Twain once said this, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. Doesn't that sound like our generation today, you know, and and uh, the, the, the kids in here that are fortunate enough to have father figures, I think I'm starting to enter some of that phase with the, uh, with the uh, ages that my children are in. And, and uh, you know, we, it, how many have had complaints from your kids about, my dad doesn't do this, or I wish my dad did this? Anybody? Am I the only one? Now, the older they'll get, they, they get, they'll... they'll Hopefully, learn to appreciate according to Mark Twain's advice here. Father's Day is a time to celebrate the huge contribution that's made to family life by our nation's dads. It's a special moment of the year to say thank you for all the sacrifices that are made, for the hard work, for the long hours of parenthood, freely given but rarely acknowledged. It's time to run the dad flag up the dad pole and dad kingdom. This passage here we read, we see a godly mother named Hannah. And Hannah, if you remember, she became the mother of Samuel, who was the last of the great judges of Israel and the first of the great Old Testament prophets. 
He became a great leader and a great man of God, I believe, thanks to the prayers and influence of a godly mother. But Hannah, of course, she was not a single mom. I believe for a brief time, Samuel had a father figure in his life. He had several of them, but he did have a father in his life named Elkanah. Although a brief time that his influence had had a great influence over him, I believe we can learn from this life uh, of uh, this father figure, Elkanah. And uh, the book of Samuel begins in the days when judges still ruled Israel. Possibly during the closing years of Samson's life. The Bible doesn't give us long introduction, but rather the opening verses simply say, look at verse uh, number 1 and 2 of 1 Samuel chapter 1. Let's read it again here. Now there was a certain man of Ramah Theav Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Today I want to focus on Elkanah and Elkanah's story. Though not as detailed as Hannah's, the Bible highlights two powerful lessons that fathers of any generation uh, could benefit from. And I want us to notice here, those here uh, this morning, some characteristics of a godly father. The first lesson that I believe we see here is number one, Godly fathers love their wives. That was an opportunity for the men to say amen if you didn't catch that. Godly fathers love their wives. Look at verse number five. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. Very, uh, very seldom if you study the lives of men in here where it talks about their home life relationships, uh, there, there's, with the exception of a few, does it say that the husband loved the wife? But specifically in God's word right here, and I don't doubt that they did love them, but when God's word says that a husband loves a wife, you take God's word for face value. The Bible says Elkanah loved Hannah. And God is the one that defines what love is. We live in a society today that confuses love for lust. And uh, we live in a society that uh, it's flesh-driven. And it's what I can benefit from this relationship. And it is seriously lacking the biblical definition of what love is. Now, within that context, biblical context of love, there are three definitions. There is the agape love. Agape love is a, is a selfless love. It is the strongest type of love that is. It is an undying love. It is a sacrificial love that God has for us, that God has for us, that God had for us when he gave his life on the cross and shed his, shed his blood uh, so that we could receive him, Lord willing, someday, if we would, and have the promise of a home in heaven. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loves us so much with that agape love. Then there's another aspect of love, and it comes from the word phileo. Uh, we get uh, the word Philadelphia from the root word phileo, and many of you would know that uh, what is the city of brotherly love? Where we get the word Philadelphia, the name Philadelphia. And so that, that word phileo is the description of a brotherly love, a friendship love. And uh, then we have another word that defines love. It is the eros love. It's where we get the word erotic. It is the fleshly aspect of a relationship. And there's nothing wrong uh, with the fleshly aspect of a love relationship when it's, when it's within the confines of the marriage relationship. Outside of the marriage relationship, it is unscriptural. It is ungodly. But we see here, we see that this man, Elkanah, Loved his wife, Hannah. The Bible says he loved her. And I believe that's something that Samuel experienced and that Samuel saw in the brevity of his life when he lived with Elkanah. 
and his mother, uh, Hannah, in their household before she took him and gave him back to the priest and dedicated him to the Lord. And he ministered the Lord uh, to the Lord there all the days of his life. As a head coach at UCLA, John Wooden won 10 NCAA championships in a 12-year period. That's saying something. And in his memoirs, A Lifetime of Reflections on and off the court, he writes this, The best thing that a father can do for his children is to love their mother. I think he's right. I believe all the biblical evidence we see of godly families uh, would highlight that as well. And dads, it goes without saying that your kids need and deserve your love. But if you're married, your wife comes first. And we need to be reminded of that. This might be tough for some people to hear. You know, what about the kids? We need to put them first. The kids are my life. The kids. No, without that marriage relationship, you wouldn't have those kids that God blessed you with. And there's a priority that God puts in our relationships here. And uh, just about every relationship expert agrees. Now, there are times when a child's immediate needs might come first momentarily, but ultimately the marriage bond has to be paramount. Your marriage comes first, then your kids. And when it's the other way around, bad things happen. When kids are the center of the universe, they grow up thinking they're the center of the universe. Uh, But kids who grow up watching their dad model and express true love for their mom, they will learn the right way to love and be loved as well. The Bible instructs us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We see that definition of agape love right in that verse there. Even as Christ loved the church, who is the church? The church is compiled, uh, consists of those who are saved, uh, baptized, uh, born-again believers that are assembled together. God gave his life for us. He was an example of a loving father. And that's what Elkanah did. He loved Hannah very much, and he showed it. Of course, there are numerous ways that we can show our spouses, show our wives that, that uh, uh, our wife, that's not plural, okay? Uh, I learned the lesson uh, from, uh, from Elkanah. But uh, ways that we need to show our wife that we love them. But I want you to notice two of those here that I see in this passage. They are works and words. They are works and words. The Bible says this. I believe that Elkanah showed his love by his works. At dinner time, the Bible says in verse number five, the Bible says here, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion for he loved Hannah. It was a It was such a small but significant act of love that Elkanah showed his wife. He gave her a worthy portion of uh, the food there, and uh, he showed his love to her. Elkanah loved his wife, and he tried to show it in simple acts of service. Now, dads, we can do similar acts of service uh, for our wife. Uh, We can, uh, several things we can do. You can make the bed in the morning. Uh, You can uh, do the, have the kids do the dishes. You can, uh, there are many things that we can do, but we ought to be doing simple acts, simple uh, acts of work to show our love uh, to our wife. We can take her on dates. We can be sure and make time and, and show that this relationship is important and schedule a weekly or uh, at the very least monthly times where we take them out on dates and say, okay, uh, children, you need to spend some time with your mom. You need to spend some time with my spouse. And so we're, we're setting this side of time for us. I want you to know that your mom is very important to me. We can get her flowers once in a while. Live ones, I would prefer. But let's show our spouses, our spouse, that we love them through our works. I believe that's one of the acts that Elkanah did here in scripture. Not only did Elkanah show his love for his wife through works, but he showed his love through words. He showed his love through words. Look at verse number eight. Elkanah also showed love through his words during the meal. Now, now this, uh, this doesn't give much support to, uh, 
uh, to him not being a fathead, okay? Uh, as you, if you're familiar with the story, I've always been like, you know, um, I appreciate the heart behind it, but man, you might want to work on that, Elkanah. Look at verse number eight. The Bible teaches us that Elkanah, or uh, Hannah, well, she couldn't have a child. She was barren. Uh, the Lord hadn't given her children, and she wanted a child so bad. And, and uh, these are Elkanah's words of assurance here. Comforting words. Look at verse number eight. Then Elkanah, her husband, then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Get the picture here with me. Hannah was so sad and distraught and and she, she wanted to have children so bad that she called out to the Lord and she was weeping and praying and calling out to the Lord. And the Bible says she was in bitterness of soul. That's how bad she wanted to have a child. And then here comes Elkanah. Honey, what's, what's wrong? Am not I better to you than 10 sons? I mean, you got me. You got me right here, okay? I'm better than 10 sons. I don't know that it was uh, so consoling, but I see he made an attempt. He made an attempt to communicate with his spouse. He made an attempt to communicate with his wife and comfort her and console her. I can just see the dopey smile on his face when he says this, you know, babe, you got me. And he, he said his wife, uh, he saw his wife was hurting and he used words to encourage her and to show his love. And by the way, uh, uh, women, be patient with us. That's what we ought to do. We ought to comfort with words. We ought to love with our words as well. Yes, with actions and yes, with works. And, and, uh, but yes, we ought, to, we ought to love with our words as well. And by the way, it takes deliberation. It takes work to do that. Christian author Robert Morgan, he identified five types of conversation that make up the fabric of uh, the marriage relationship. These are they, man. Small talk, serious talk, self-talk, soul talk, and sweet talk. Few marriages fail when these five types of communication are practiced between husbands and wives. For sometimes what we don't say is just as important what we do say. We need to work on our communication Husbands, let's be like Elkanah. Let's love our spouse. And uh, with our words, let's love our spouse with our works. And uh, I don't want to pat Elkanah on the back without also commenting his glaring mistake of having the two women. And I already made the disclaimer that just because that shows that there doesn't mean that that's God's perfect will or perfect example. And uh, <clears throat> so um, we see here, uh, we see... Uh, an example of a godly father. We see that Elkanah, uh, he, he loved his wife. And godly fathers, we love our spouse. He loved his spouse with works. He loved his spouse with words. But then number two, this morning, I want to say this, and we see this as the example in Scripture here with Elkanah. Godly fathers love to and lead in worship. Godly father is going to lead his family in worship. Christian author John Dresser, he wrote regarding leading his family in Christ's likeness. He said this, last but certainly not least, I would make God an intimate friend of my family. I would use his name freely. I would communicate, uh, I would communicate to them that he is involved in all of our family decisions. I, I would want them to see me and uh, see me pray and read God's word and search for his direction and leadership. And a godly father, uh, an example of a father, is going to lead his family in worship. You may not know exactly how to do it, and, uh, you, but, uh, but you can ask God for wisdom and ask you to help do it. Ask God to help you to lead your family to worship him. If it wasn't for God to begin with, you wouldn't have a family. Godly fathers will lead and love their family 
in worship. Elkanah was that kind of a father. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3, this man went up out of this, his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. We see that it was the example of Elkanah to lead his family in worship. I want to challenge every father in here. Maybe you've, maybe you've not seen that example in your life. Ask God for wisdom to help you do it in your family now. Maybe you didn't do that in the past, and this is a, a, foreign, a foreign subject to you. Ask God for wisdom to help you to do it moving on in life. We had a good time at the men and boys camp out and want to continue to do it. And we had a good time, and the boys were out frogging in the middle of the night, and and we had a time of fishing, and we had campfire with s'mores, and, and we cooked hot dogs on the campfire, and we, we had tents out there, and, and I got a miserable night's sleep, and I went to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, but I had a good time just being with my kids and experiencing misery together. But the highlight of the trip was, was not the catching the fish, although that was an awesome thing for me. The highlight of the trip was gathering around the campfire and singing praises to our God, opening God's word, challenging each other, and leading our young men in worship, trying to convince and communicate to them. And man, we want to do fun things and manly things and all that. We want to teach you how to be good, strong young men, but we want to point you to our God. I want to point you to the almighty God that gave this life and he shed his blood so that you could someday hopefully receive him as your personal savior and live a life that is for the purpose of, of, of God. Why else live life if there's no God? The miserable bunch of 80 years down here, you don't have God. He desires to help you through life. He desires for you to follow him and point you in the direction, uh, for him to point you in the direction of righteousness and purpose for your life. We see that Elkanah led his family in worship. Each year there were three special religious uh, times, uh, festivals, if you will, that were he held at the tabernacle. Even though they had to travel 12 miles, this family, Elkanah and Hannah and, and others, even though they had to travel 12 miles uh, one way on foot through the blistering desert oftentimes, Elkanah probably never missed worship times. And after spending the whole weekend worshiping in God's house, the Bible adds in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19, he says this, And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and uh, came to their house to Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Elkanah, we see in this story here, he had to get in one more worship service before they headed home. He had to get in one more uh, time of a sacrifice and one more prayer. And uh, worship was important to Elkanah. And he led his family in prayer and praise. And that's what every child needs in their father's life. I read about a young boy who showed up late for Sunday school. This is oftentimes our mentality as dads. It could be a lazy mentality in a rut, I'll say that. That, uh, that I can get into as a father. There's, there's a purpose for fatherhood, and God wants me to exert that purpose and, and teach the children that he's entrusted me with. They're on loan to me for a brief amount of time on this earth. God's entrusted them to me. But I read about a young boy who showed up late for Sunday school one Sunday. His teacher asked why he was running behind, and the boy replied, I was supposed to be going fishing, but my dad told me I needed to go to church instead. The teacher was very impressed and asked the boy if his dad had explained to him why it was more important to go to church than to go fishing. 
The boy hung his head and replied, yeah. Dad said he didn't have enough bait for both of us. Now, unfortunately, that sounds like some father's. That's not the kind of father we're called to be. Dad's God has called us to be the spiritual leaders of our families, to be his representatives in our, in, in our households. God desires for us to lead. I read another true story about a little girl who was having trouble sleeping during a thunderstorm. The thunder clapped. The little girl screamed, and she jumped out of bed and rushed to her daddy's bedside. He put his arms around her, and he explained that she didn't have to fear anything. God was going to take care of them and her, and because God loved them so much, she said, I know God loves me, but right now, Daddy, I want someone with skin on. Sorensen said, a child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in his father. Dads, we need to love God. We need to worship God. And we need to lead our kids to do so as well. But if we don't, chances are they probably won't either. Did you know that statistics tell us that in families where mom is a regular churchgoer but dad isn't, only 37% of the kids will attend church even sporadically when they grow up. On the other hand, in households where dad attends church regularly, 78% of the kids will still attend church when they grow up. Did you hear that? The influence of a father figure. Um, and in families where dads attend church but mom doesn't, listen to this, it actually goes up to 84%. Because your children see how important God is to you. And they want to follow in your footsteps. Dads, we need to commit to be godly fathers so that our children will be more apt to find a father in God. I'm going to close with this. Did you know that 90% of homeless and runaway children 71% of high school dropouts, 75% of youth and drug abuse centers, and 85% of all youth in prison, what they have in common? Probably guessed it. They all come from fatherless homes. These numbers, they show that children with involved fathers have higher self-esteem. They have better GPAs, better grade point averages. They grow up to be the most compassionate of adults. Dads, we are vital. And the role that we play, it isn't a laughing matter. It's not a joke. It's serious business. We've got tall orders from an awesome God. So I want to say thank you. To the fathers in here, thank you for stepping up. Thank you for understanding and for trying to be a man of God in this life. Thank you for trying to be a role model. Maybe when you don't understand how it all going to play out, how it all works, thank you for trying to be a mentor. Thank you to those who may not be dads, but you step up and you fill the gap oftentimes. Think of the men here at our church who are like father figures to the young men. And the, and the young ladies at this church. Thank you to those men who say, uh, who say, I'm proud of you. You did good. Thank you for those men even at this church and, and people in life who have taken the time to correct me when I've needed correction in a loving, gracious manner. For always having our backs, for always providing for us. Thank you for loving your wife and leading in worship. Maybe you're here this morning and maybe you haven't been the kind of father you know you should be. Being a great dad is like shaving. No matter how good you shave today, you're still going to have to do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. There's no end to it. But if you want to make a change and you want to become a godly father, 
this morning, I invite you to make that commitment by praying silently here in a moment. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help lead in a prayer how you can be encouraged to be a godly father. I want to be on that journey with you. I want to be a godly father as well. Let's bow this morning. Our heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to encourage you. As it's come now to the time of our invitation, in a moment the piano will begin to play. But I hope you've been challenged from God's word. This morning, I want to be a godly father myself. And if that's your prayer as well, I want to encourage you to consider these words here as we pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for our fathers. Thank you for your example, for the example of their love and sacrifice that are an echo of your love and sacrifice. Lord, this morning, would you please strengthen us? Would you please give us wisdom? Lord, you say you'll give wisdom liberally when we ask for it. You say we have not because we ask not. This morning, Lord, I'm asking you to help me be a godly father. Help me to lead my family. Help me to love my wife. Help me to lead my family in worship. Thank you for the young people you've entrusted under my care. Thank you for the young people of this church, Lord. Please strengthen me. Would you help me? Would you help us to be men of God? Help us to love our families with the same unconditional love that you show us. Would you forgive me for my failings as a father and help me to press on for you? Now, maybe you're here this, eve this morning and with heads bowed and eyes closed. If, if you grew up without a father or without maybe much of one, then Father's Day may just be another fatherless day to you. But if that's the case, I want to encourage you to find a father in God. The Bible calls him our heavenly father when we get saved. When we get saved, you get adopted into the family of God. And let me tell you this, whether you had an earthly father or not growing up, God the father is all you need. He's all, he's who you need. I want to encourage you this morning, you can find a father in God. You can do that by being born in his family as one of his children. Every person in their lifetime must do so in order to be a child of God. And here's how you can do that this morning. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to explain to you how you can be born into God's family. You see, the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are all separated from God when we are born because of a sin condition that we inherited. The Bible says in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, for that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven, and there is no way that we can earn or work our way to heaven. We need a Savior, and the only Savior that can save us is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. You see, he died as a sacrificial lamb in our place. He died so that we don't have to. And if we'll acknowledge our sin problem, if we'll acknowledge our sin condition, and if we'll receive him as our payment and sacrifice, we can be saved and born into his family as one of his children. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then finally, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And how do we do that? In Romans 10, 13, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And when we get saved, we get born into God's family. 
If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, you've never asked Christ to be your Savior, I would like to encourage you to pray with me right now. Now keep in mind, there's not a, a magic prayer that saves anybody, but it's simply the acknowledgement of our sin condition, receiving Christ for the payment of our sin, and trusting wholly in him as that payment, calling upon him. Let me help you call on the Lord this morning if you've never done so. Would you pray something to this effect? Would you say, Dear Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry for that. I know that I don't deserve heaven, but I do believe that your son Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin. And right now, Lord, the best way I know how, I put my faith and trust in you alone as my Savior and payment for my sin. Lord, save me. Help me to live for you out of appreciation for saving me. This morning, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer calling on the Lord, I want to tell you that you've been saved. You've been born into God's family. But also, I'd like to ask this, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed and called on the Lord just now, would you mind slipping your hand up an acknowledgement that you did so? Would you slip your hand up? Nobody's looking around. Nobody's looking around. If you prayed and called on the Lord, would you slip your hand up? Would you slip your hand up? I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? If you just called on the Lord, would you slip your hand up? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're here this morning. You may put your hands down. Maybe here this morning you say you and you prayed earlier. You asked you asked the Lord to help you. You asked the Lord to help you be a godly father. Uh, I, pr I, I prayed. That was my prayer. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. If you're one of the men in here that needs God's help and you prayed and you'll acknowledge God that you need his wisdom, would you slip your hand up? Would you slip your hand up? All right, let's all stand this morning. Let's